Before I came to Scotland, I ran the Northern Ireland Environment Agency, which I know some of you will have interacted with. And over in Northern Ireland, everything's in the one agency, so the equivalents of CEPA, SNH, Marine Scotland, even the policy stuff, etc. And I struggled to get this sort of interaction between different divisions of the one organisation. So I think it's great credit to SNH looking at the program you've organised of bringing different people together. So thank you very much for the chance. Um, I, I guess building on what you said, uh, I, I try and keep quiet that I'm trained as an economist. I don't really believe in a huge amount of it. I don't think it's a particularly rigorous discipline actually. But I got into the environment game partly because I worked at the Treasury in the state of Victoria in the late 80s, early 90s. And climate change, uh, actually we sort of forget ozone depletion was more prominent back then, but climate change was starting to come in. And they needed someone to brief the treasurer on the environment because treasurers need to be briefed on everything. And people thought I was a communist because I turned my computer off when I went home to save energy. Because in those days, you know, people, particularly in a treasury, just did everything. Well, you can brief on the environment. And out of that, when the Victorian EPA set up their first economics team, I was the first full-time person brought in um, and sort of fell into it by chance. And it's been a great uh, 25, 30 years because I think the privilege we have working on the environment is you're interacting with all different parts of society, all different parts of the economy. And the challenge that you alluded to is really, and this is a key thing behind our One Planet Prosperity approach, um, the history of environmental management, certainly in environment protection, but I know also a lot in areas like nature, habitat, species protection, has, I don't know quite what the right words are to characterize it, incremental, specific, you could say the 20th century was about um, specific challenges, specific solutions. The 21st century is about systems challenge and in fact systems collapse. So I feel as though what CEPA is partly responsible for in our own small way as is SNH is whether our species uh, survives or not. So the planet will survive. I don't talk about saving the planet because the planet will be here. It's being radically changed by our species um, so the reason we chose one planet prosperity is very deliberate. It says there is only one planet. It's the only thing my scientists let me say without being peer reviewed that they trust an economist to wander around saying that there's only one planet we can safely say that. Prosperity doesn't say growth. It doesn't say anything about the economy. It just says humanity needs to decide something that you can't change. You can't have two Earths, there's only one we need to choose how we prosper on that one earth. And I think what we're finding is, and the rapid change in public debate around the world in the last couple of years, we're working out we need a very different way to prosper as a species. That the old models of growth of how you run an economy are just uh, leading us to literally destruction. So what role can a, an EPA, which is one small player in one small nation, play uh, is what I want to talk about. Thank you. So, uh, Mathis Vakanagel, who was one of the two people who invented the ecological footprint with uh, Bill Rees. So Mathis is Swiss, uh, lives in California where he runs the Global Footprint Network. Um, I'm lucky enough to be a very close friend of his, had breakfast with him in London a couple of weeks ago. Uh, we got him involved, the reason I uh, built a relationship with Mathis is we got him to Victoria, it must have been about 2001. Uh, for two weeks and we took him back three or four times. I've worked with him. He's come to Scotland a few times. Uh, we'll be bringing him back again. The reason was we needed a simple metric to try and explain this overall challenge because the businesses we regulate were quite used to saying, okay, we can't put more than this phosphorus out of our pipes or we can't create noise beyond this boundary. But we were saying to them, but okay, that's important, really important, but actually your business like everything is out of sync with what the planet can support. So ecological footprint was very attractive to us. Not so much as a measurement technique to practically apply in decision making, but to convey the overall problem. 
Now in Victoria at the time when we got Mathis to measure Victoria's ecological footprint, we were at four planets, it's now five. That's really the size of the city. I was back in Melbourne on holidays a couple of weeks ago and um, I drove 80 miles to have breakfast with a former colleague. I was still in Melbourne. Um, there are five lane, both way f freeways. Um, one, they're talking about making 10 lanes. This is inside the city. Because if you build a city that's massive like that, you use a massive amount of energy moving people and goods around. It's got the biggest tram network in the world. Huge, a, a bigger rail network in Melbourne than Scotland has. Huge number of buses. But you still have to have thousands and thousands of cars because it's just so big. So this captures that overall challenge. And I've talked to school kids. I've talked to CEOs of businesses. I've talked to first ministers. No one doesn't get it. It's a very simple way to communicate. It then frames for us how we radically have to change as an EPA. So I talk about um, phase one to phase two EPAs. And I fought very hard to get the SEPA job. I wasn't looking to leave Northern Ireland. Uh, but I did that because I thought SEPA was one of the you know, half dozen best in the world at what I would call phase one EPA. So Victoria, where I'm from, had the third EPA in the world. The first was 67 in Sweden. The second was 69, uh, the US EPA, and the third was the Victorian EPA in 1970. So Richard Nixon, a Republican president, set up the US EPA in 69. The current Republican president doesn't seem to have the same commitment to the environment. Mm. Uh, certainly what he's doing to the US EPA is just absolutely extraordinary, winding back all sorts of laws and programs, etc. The reason Victoria had the third EPA in the world was Melbourne was the manufacturing base for Australia and pretty much Southeast Asia. So. The state of Victoria has something like 800 years of brown coal, which is worse than black coal. So, you know, 100 years or so ago, well, we need manufacturing in Australia. Uh, well, we'll put it in Melbourne because they've got all this cheap energy for hundreds of years. We didn't know about climate change then. Now, that meant that Melbourne had a huge industrial base. And if you go to the history of how this worked, Melbourne was founded by uh, British... Um, people in 1832. The Aboriginals have been there for tens of thousands of years. It was based on the Yarra River in the middle of the city. Um, small population, huge gold rush, a couple of hundred miles north, exploded in size. So you, instead of being a little village, all sorts of things and factories. And it became known as Smelburn in the 1880s because of the pollution from the factories. Now, environmental management in the 1880s was the founding fathers, and of course, they're all men, said, close the factories, build new ones on the Maribyrnong River the second river, because that's where the workers live. So including being killed and, or in addition to being killed and injured in factories before health and safety laws, they can put up with the pollution. So in the 1960s, the Maribyrnong River used to regularly catch on fire. It had so much industrial pollution in it. Grangemouth would not be a big industrial area in Melbourne. It's a massive industrial city. And pilots are riding the premier saying, we can't see the runways at your airport because smog was so terrible. Now. I've talked to people who were there from day one. In, the Act was passed in 1970. The agency was set up in 71. You didn't go out to companies and say, when they're pouring pollution into rivers and air sheds, sending huge amounts of waste to landfills, well, it's, uh, let's have a workshop on the circular economy or natural capital or something. You put some rules on and say, look, could you get some of your raw materials in your products rather than back out in the environment? It's the right thing to do in phase one. And you've got the same stories here about the Clyde River from Seeper and its predecessors, um, et cetera, et cetera, in the EPA world. If we keep doing that, we are of no use to society and we should be shut down. Because if you look at this diagram, we don't measure this, but if you say we've got people who don't meet Scotland's environmental laws that we administer, that existing non-compliance, okay, we're at three planets. If we got everyone up to the law, we might get to 2.8 planets. What we do is create very significant local environmental improvement. The flaring, I don't know if any of you live out that way or you've seen it on the news a lot from Exxon and Shell um, out near Cowden Beath and other surrounding towns, is absolutely appalling for people living there. It's terrible. It's non-compliance. We will solve that. I spend a lot of time on it. But the only time I met the First Minister was at a um, private dinner about the UN Sustainable Development Goals, and I said, well, look, because she happened to be asked a question about Moss Moran and Sepa that day in Parliament. She gets a question about us once every two years. I said, nice to meet you. I said, yeah, I was talking about you today. I said, yeah, I know. <laughs> um, I said, we'll fix that. And then the people of Cowden Beath and the other surrounding towns will sleep better. If 
for one or two weeks a year where their lives are just totally disrupted. But if we get two or two and a half degrees warming, no one will sleep well. So we have to get businesses we regulate to compliance, but that's nowhere near enough. They have to get towards zero carbon. They have to get towards zero water use. They have to get towards zero materials use and waste nothing. So when I was asked at a water conference, what's the future of water strategy? I was in one of those closing sessions and there was an academic and a technical person from somewhere and a trade body person. We had five or 10 minutes and they used it. And I was the last person. What's the future of water management? And I said, we won't use much, we'll waste none. That's what we're trying to get across with these sorts of diagrams. That if you're a business, and the reason we use One Planet Prosperity is we can say to a business, look, you can meet our laws and you keep us happy as far as we can push you by law, but you won't exist very long. That's all you do. Because people will demand by necessity for you to go further. There's a speech, uh, it's on the web, it's getting a lot of play. It was earlier in the week, um, CEO of a major uh, food producing company. I can't remember which one. Uh, we do some work with Unilever, who's often seen as the world leader in sustainability in business. $500 billion US has been signed up by these companies. They are saying things like, and if you look at his four minute speech, he's just on a panel at a conference. He said, look, we have thought we could use science to basically dominate nature, to produce food in a certain way, and we were completely wrong. And I don't know whether he's right or wrong, but he knows his stuff. You guys will know this better than I do. He said, we basically got down to relying on nine plants to produce crops. Now, I don't know whether that means nine sort of classes, but it doesn't really matter. But he's saying that's way less than existed before we industrialized, industrialized food production. So we need to radically change that. So these companies are signing up to say, we will start buying from sources that are expanding the number of plants that produce. He said, we are killing. There's a bit in his speech where people start clapping because he says something like, I think it's, we need to stop subsidies that kill nature and support subsidies that make it thrive. What he's saying is in the private sector, they're taking $500 billion US to do exactly that, to change and reverse that trend. For us, what we need to do is stop thinking that as a regulator of the businesses we regulate, we're the only or even the key influence on the environmental performance of the people we regulate. Now, if you go back, when the Victorian EPA was set up in 1970, and this is you know years before Google or anything like that, most Australian manufacturing will be the subsidiary of an American company, a Canadian company, a German company, an English company, a Japanese company, etc. And all these people, well, what's an EPA? Now, the American holding company people would ring up, so Nixon set one of these up, blah, blah, blah. So they took someone who had no talent, no career prospects, and said, we're creating a new role environment manager. Could you deal with this weird thing called the EPA so the rest of us can run the business? The evidence that this was what they did was 25 years later when I joined the EPA, they were still the environment manager for their companies. They had no career prospects, et cetera, et cetera. That's not the case now. These jobs in businesses are highly sought after. Lots of applications, people fight to get in there. In our DNA, we are trained to think we're the thing that influences what Exxon does on the environment or what the whiskey companies do, etc. But in fact, this is their world now. So if you go into an M&S food hall, you know in the department stores, the food hall will be in the basement. It's not a standalone food outlet for M&S, but in their big department stores. When you go downstairs, have you ever noticed that there's claims on the wall? Can anyone know what they are, what they talk about? They're all designed to make you buy more stuff. They're a retailer. Well, there's not a single thing about price or quality. So someone's trying to sell something to you. They don't say it's cheaper than you can get somewhere else. They don't say it's better quality. They say it has these environmental or social characteristics. Nothing you are about to buy will need to be landfilled by 2023 or something. Um, no child labor has been used in the production of anything. All the seafood you see has been sustainably harvested. So we regulate the salmon industry. You guys have a role in that as well, particularly in advising on our decision making and local authority decision making, sometimes a very key role. Um, M&S, Tesco, all those others possibly audit the salmon farms more than we do. And I say possibly because I'm trying to be a bit 
They don't. They, they do. They know more about those salmon farms than we probably do. Because they make these claims in the market, they need to know that the claims they're making from the people they're buying actually stack up. Now, we can sit there and just say, well, we just talk with the salmon farms. We've got a big role. This diagram is saying we, we regulate 33 sectors. We're now developing what we call sector plans. And we look at all the influences around that sector and say, who else is influencing them? How do we partner with the other influences to make it easy for the regulated business to be a really good environmental performer and hard for them to be a really bad one? So there's all sorts of constraints around how much a retailer can talk to a regulatory body about what they know about something we regulate because there's commercial confidentiality, etc. But the mere fact that I know all the people in M&S and Tesco, et cetera, who do this stuff, doesn't particularly thrill the salmon industry. Because if they're trying to gain both of us, and I'm not saying they are, but if they were, the fact that we've got a good relationship, that should suit them if they're a good performer. If their environmental performance is good, they want to work well, they should be pleased that the regulator has a good relationship with a commercial body in their supply chain. If they're not trying to do the right thing, that's actually a threat to them. So we need to get more sophisticated at how do we map out all these different influences and use them. Um, if I give you a practical example, in the state of Victoria, we had something like 4,000 um, car repair places. So car repair places would be, you know, three or four people um, repairing a car. And each one of them, they'd wash some toxic stuff down stormwater drains. They, they had a particular sort of air emission, I can't remember what it was and they'd make noise. And that was pretty much it. Now the Victorian EPA was about 350 people. We were regulating a bigger industrial complex than in Scotland. We're not gonna to go to these car repair places very often, but cumulatively they were a significant impact. The two insurance companies in Australia, which control 95% of the market, had signed up to the UN Environment Program Finance Initiative, which EPA Victoria administered for the UN for about 10 years while I was there. I signed it in um, Deutsche Bank's headquarters in Frankfurt. Because they'd signed up, and this is, they signed in the early 2000s, so 17, 18 years ago, we went to them and said, you accredit car repair places. So no one takes their car to be repaired by someone who's not authorised or accredited by an insurance company, because then you won't get your insurance paid. Now because the insurance companies accredit them for quality, they go and audit them regularly. So we said, well, if we develop an environment management plan, not an ISO 14001, which is the standard one, just a bit of paper they stick on the wall that says, don't wash stuff down stormwater drains. If you're doing something noisy, could you close the doors? And I can't remember what the instruction was on air quality. You know, it's simple, it's not complex. What they did was they found, one of the insurance companies found one of the smash repair places that wasn't doing the right thing. Um, did you organise to get a call if I was boring? <laughs> <laughs> oh, happens a lot. Um, and they took away their accreditation. What do you think the other 3,999 car repair places did? They started taking the environment seriously. Because we'd analysed, not in a systematised way like this, but we'd had a chat and thought about it, how do we get at these people to help them do the right thing? We analysed basically this map. So we now have 16 sector plans, whiskey, crop production, boom, boom, boom. Uh, there's another 17 to be developed over the next year and a half. Naturally, in many of them, SNH is in one of these bubbles because you will have a key role working with them. That gives us the ability when we're dealing with a business to say, well, you're trying to deal with X. What do you work with on SNH about this? Uh, nothing. Well, do you know that SNH do X, Y, Z? Would you like to be put in touch with them, etc.? We might find that they don't know that they've got obligations that you <laughs> need to look after. Um, we can do the same with our other government partners here in Scotland. So it's just a way for us to say two things. Um, each sector plan says this. What are the compliance challenges? Okay, so we've got to fix them. Compliance is non-negotiable. For goodness sake, if we're going to get from three planets to one, if we've got to save ourselves from climate change, biodiversity collapse, the least people can do is comply. Now, we say compliance is non-negotiable. What we actually mean is um, you can't negotiate to get out of complying. You might negotiate about how and when, 
So you know, if you've got if you're one percent away and the receiving environment's not being damaged, we might give you a bit more time, etc. But you're not going to negotiate out of getting there. We then identify what are the biggest beyond compliance opportunities. So if I take an example, the whiskey industry, which is our probably our best regulated sector in terms of performance, um, they have beyond compliance targets for themselves for water reduction, um, waste reduction, and carbon reduction. Now, importantly. That is through supply chains. It's not just their own operations. What we regulate is their own operations, which is probably now 2% of their environmental impact. Their environmental impact is right throughout their supply chain and value chain. But because they want to work with us, because we've got a good relationship, we can say, well, the barley growers use water. If you go back to last year when we had uh, a drought, if the barley growers take water from water stressed environments, if the distillers then do it themselves, you really risk environmental damage. There's also the economic and social risk of people not being able to make a living. We have an incentive to work together. So we have people who go out to the barley growers. We have other people who go out to the distillers. Under a sector plan, for the first time ever, we have a way of saying there are some shared objectives. Now, lots of clever people at SEPA way before I got there were trying to do this stuff, and sometimes with great success. And you'll have experience of working well with SEPA um, on various things. What this does is normalise it and make it easy. There's a whole bunch of other internal reforms I won't go into to do that. But it's trying to make it easy for us not to stop delivering the stuff we've always delivered, the local environmental improvements from compliance stuff, but to get on to what the science and the evidence says we all have to crack. We, have, we don't have much time to massively reduce greenhouse gas emissions. We don't have much time to do all the things that you guys know better than we do that are the terrible threats to biodiversity which are every bit as big as uh, climate change uh, they're related but you know climate change gets all the publicity the last couple of years biodiversity collapses started to get it we have an ability now to say what are the big things you can do and try and support people to do them um, final thing is we've created a couple of um, other new tools so We've got a tool called Sustainable Growth Agreements. This is the signing of the Sustainable Growth Agreement with Scottish Water. And you, well, you can see me there. You'll obviously know our cab sec. And if you don't know, that's um, Douglas Millicent from the MD of Scottish Water. Now, I stand on conference platforms with Douglas and I, I say, um, I'll just tell this story to finish. I sort of dump my slides and I say, look, let's say it's 2040. 2050, I don't know, 2030. It'll be some time. It won't be too far away. If you're alive and you've got a grandchild and you're walking along a river in Scotland and you say, they, you walk past and there's this big industrial looking building, clearly hasn't operated for years, got tumbleweeds around it and a fence you can't get through. And the grandchild says, Grandma or Grandpa, what's that? I say, oh, yeah, we used to have these things. Oh, what were they? Uh, wastewater treatment plants. A what? <laughs> a wastewater treatment plant. A waste? What was that? Well, in the old days, we used to take water into houses and factories and office buildings and so on. There used to be other pipes we used to have that took it to one of these things and then they'd clean it up a bit and put it back in the river or the ocean. And the grandchild would look at the grandparent as if they were mad. Mm. But this must have cost millions. Oh, no, billions. Billions and billions and billions of pounds. Billions and billions. So we used to spend billions and billions and billions of pounds to make it easy for people to waste the environment. What was SEPA doing? Why didn't they stop this? Well, Scottish Water had to do it under SEPA licence or that SEPA would have prosecuted them. <laughs> now, it was the right thing to do in phase one. All EPAs around the world did it because what we were focused on in phase one was environmental quality. Because I do stand on the platform and say, now, Douglas, don't go and turn them all off tomorrow because you'll <laughs> very quickly get access to some traditional SEPA services if you do. But now the challenge is as much or more environmental quantity. We can't be affording to use water and waste it in the way we have. We just can't. So then I say, but I can't stand here and say, so Scottish water, you have to reinvent the way water is used in Scotland. Because that will need massive innovation. Innovation has risk. So I can't say, well, we're the regulator. You need to massively innovate. You bear all the risk and we'll take some of the return. We'll, we'll claim the environmental gain. The Sustainable Growth Agreement is really a way of sharing risk and return because what we've signed up to is three trials. 
where in three different parts of Scotland with different partners, we've agreed, well, let's try something different on urban drainage here, something that's much less environmental impact, reuses rainwater better, all that blah, 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 blah. I can't remember what the other two are. I probably should know because I keep using it as an example. But by doing trials, it's really easy to experiment. And you can agree what happens if it goes wrong and design the trial that if something goes wrong, that the worst is there's a bit of environmental degradation, but not much, it's, it's livable with. Because we have to start taking some risks. You can't totally reinvent your economy and society without massive innovation, without taking some risks. So the challenge for us is we're not gonna let people out of the law. We're not just gonna go and say, go and innovate. And you know, if the environment gets screwed over, well, that's a bit of, bit of cost of innovation. We have to work out how to innovate, how to take risks, how to work in partnership, how to support each other in ways that give us the best chance to find things that work and or when they work or they don't work, how do we learn from them and build and do something um, better the next time? So I'll leave it there. What I've tried to give you is an idea of why I think all EPAs in the world need to radically change, not because what we did in phase one was wrong, it was the right thing to do in phase one. It's just like if you're making typewriters, you don't say, well, we'll make a better typewriter to, com to compete with a smartphone. You say the typewriter was a great thing for a hundred or a couple hundred years, now we need to get into something else. So I'll leave it there and we'll open it up.